Welcome everyone to the talk number three from Hanoi Ad Hoc. Um, this evening, the topic is going to be on encounters with architectural modernism in Vietnam. So a really interesting and exciting topic. And so I'd like to share a little bit with you about the, our speakers today, our guest speakers. So we have Christina Schwenkel and we have Mel Schenk who are joining us to talk about their long-term research projects that they have on Vietnam. So with this talk, um, they're gonna be drawing on their um, recent books that they've published on architecture in Vietnam and share their different research approaches. And they'll, in their talk, they'll have a conversation where they're exploring parallels between the North and the South of Vietnam and looking at the different responses. So in terms of how the modernist architecture was influencing the vernacular or local architecture that was being produced. So Christina is Professor of Anthropology and Director of Trip and is going to draw from her book, uh, Building Socialism, the Afterlife of East German Architecture in Urban Vietnam. And she's going to discuss designs for industrial and, and social in infrastructure in Vien. And Mel is, his background is as an American architect, um, look, working on major projects and an author. And Mel particularly is going to be looking at his research and his most recent book, Southern Vietnamese Modernist Architecture. And it will be looking at the um, impact of international modernism through the education of Vietnamese architects in the 1930s. And then looking at the changes and, as they went through the decades on architecture. So first of all, I'd like to introduce um, Chung, who's going to talk about the origins of Hanoi Ad Hoc, um, so that you understand a bit more about this really exciting initiative. Um, thanks, Michelle, for the introduction. Um, and thanks, Christina and Mel, um, to accepting our uh, invitation. Uh, it's an honor for me and Hanoi Ad Hoc to to have you here joining us to, on our conversation about architecture in, in the Vietnam. So maybe um, I like, because I already explained about uh, about how to add a few times in the past. So uh, this time I would like to focus more on the topic of modernism. Um, so despite the, the attitude of um, uh, skepticism or the um, um, even the rejection towards the ideologies of modernism, uh, we can't ignore uh, the impact or the the legacy uh, of the modernism in the, the uh, in in history. Um, in architecture, modernism is known as um, a manifesto that uh, has been marked by its ideologies of uh, bridging the the beauty and of sim simplicity and functionality, pro promoting the mass industri uh, industrialization uh, production. Um, as a, you know, Le Corbusier has said that uh, the house has a machine for living in. The modernist uh, uh, protagonist like uh, Le Corbusier or Walter Corbusier um, is highly uh, in influenced by uh, the industrial aspect of the built form where function play the fundamental role in determining form. Um, so the, the linkage and binary industrialism and modernism are undeniable. And Hanu Ad Hoc 1.0 has its uh, main focus on the, on the industrial landscape and its influence on the urbanization process and pattern uh, of Hanu. Um, so having a, a thoughtful discussion in order to understand one of these uh, driving vectors that shape modernity is the main purpose of our discussion today. Um, and despite the common understanding of modernism to the universal validity defining the generic uh, architecture uh, features, uh, modernism in Vietnam or in, in Southeast Asia um, 
didn't really follow the same pattern. It has been contextualized um, according to the uh, different factors like uh, the local climate feature, human behavior, uh, or it carry ideologies in different political regimes. Uh, across the countries, um, modernism architecture had been, modernist architecture has been perceived, conceived and embraced in various ways. And it could be determined as uh, the modernist vernacular architecture in the tropical, uh, tropical context or a gesture of socialism, solidarity, solidarity between Vietnam and East Germany. Uh, so we will find out in our discussion today with uh, Christina and Mel. Um, so yeah, I will let the, the space to our speaker today to, to Thank talk you very more much. about it. Thank you. So uh, just some housekeeping. So we'll have um, the audio on mute. Um, but please in the chat, um, as you as questions arrive, um, please drop them into the chat and so we can share them with our speakers. And the format um, we will have, Mel is going to talk first for about 20 minutes and then he and Christina are going to have a conversation around what they're discussing. And Christina will have a talk for about 20 minutes as well and followed again by a conversation between Mel and Christina. And then we will open for about 15 minutes uh, Q&A following their conversation and then have a wrap up. So that's to what you can expect from us um, this evening. So now I would like with uh, to please um, give the presentation floor over to Mel Schenk for his presentation, please. Okay, thank you very much, Michelle. Well, so I'll uh, share a screen here. And here in a second. Okay, does everybody see the opening screen there? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, the um, the Vietnamese encounter with modernism really centered in Hanoi for 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 a decade. As um, a couple of artists, uh, Vietnamese artist Nam Sun, that's a pseudonym for uh, Nguyen Van Ta, and French artist Victor Tardo convinced the colonial government that they should fund and operate a fine arts college in Hanoi, the Cole Superiority of Beaux Arts de Linda Chi. And uh, in 1926, they began the architecture department and on the faculty was Ernest Heberard, the head of the uh, architecture and planning service of the colonial government. And he was the originator of the architectural style of Indochine, Indochine style, which is a fusion of uh, French Beaux-Arts classical architecture and Asian ornamentation. So I think the objective of the two artists that started the school, as well as the colonial government, that the, this, these young Vietnamese artists and architects uh, would study Western culture, Beaux Arts, uh, arts and architecture, and combine that with an intensive study of Vietnamese traditional arts and crafts and architecture. But it didn't turn out that way. Uh, in 1929, Arthur Cruz graduated from the Col de Beaux Arts in Paris, and in 1930, he came out to head the architecture school. And he was a modernist, and we know that because he designed two or three modernist buildings in Hanoi, two or three modernist buildings in Ho Chi Minh City that are still here. So he undoubtedly brought books and magazines with him and exposed the young, uh, certainly the architecture students, to the modernism of the of the early, you know, the early 1920s. So that includes architecture from America, architecture from Russia, as well as uh, as Europe. Now, students from the north and the south and the central areas all came together at the school, and therefore were exposed to the common base of modernism, um, primarily through Arthur Cruz. But they also, in their in study of uh, Vietnamese traditional architecture, I think also had an encounter with a different kind of modernism, uh, a Vietnamese modernism. And uh, I don't think Vietnamese would call it that, but uh, 
in a way, I think that the principles that you see in the design of Vietnamese traditional architecture, like the din here, that model you see on the right-hand side there, uh, the dins for the community halls that were built up and down the country in most of the jurisdictions, as well as Vietnamese traditional houses having a similar form. And as I think the students looked at that, they realized there's some principles that they could use to develop a new architecture beyond colonial architecture. Um, they might not have had a name for it, but I think as they looked at these principles, they started to combine what they were also seeing from international modernism. And I think that that's how they developed Vietnamese modernist architecture. So you, as you look at then on the right, on the left-hand side there, the General Science Library, um, inaugurated in December 1971 in Saigon. Uh, the architects are Nguyen Hu Tien and then uh, Bui Quang Han. And as you look down the um, facade of that building, you start to see some parallels with the dins or the traditional houses, starting with the roof edge there, that slanted roof edge, uh, the cross beams that come out supporting the over wide overhanging roof with the airspace in between that allows ventilation or else a, a, a layer of insulated air like a floating roof. Uh, then, of course, you got a strong expression of structure, which is a primary uh, principle of modernist architecture to start with. But you see very clearly in the wood uh, post and beam construction of the dens or the traditional houses. And then, a, then there's the Brie Soleil screens, in this case, using a very Vietnamese pattern that people knew and understood and loved. And then finally, down towards the bottom, um, the dens often had verandas, certainly the traditional houses did. Uh, in this case, you got the reverse of that, uh, but it does the same function. It keeps the sun from uh, heating up the exterior wall and provides some shade for socialization space. And then uh, in front of the dens, in accordance with the uh, Vietnamese foam tui, uh, there's normally a body of water. Here in front of the uh, General Science Library, across the whole expanse of that facade, you got a water moat that cools the air before it traverses through the Brie Soleil screens into the reading rooms beyond. In 1940, virtually or after World War II, the Japanese occupation, virtually every building in the South uh, became Vietnamese modernist, designed by Vietnamese architects. So there's only a few that weren't, like the US Embassy course, was designed by an American architect. But as the uh, Vietnamese people could see these buildings uh, as they came about, uh, I think they could see that uh, there are principles in there that they understood from their memories of the traditional architecture. So they, they took these, this vocabulary or this, these language of Vietnamese modernist architecture and they started applying it to their own houses. Now, by 1975, there were only 140 some Vietnamese architects that were registered by the Southern government. And so they were all busy with the large buildings or they were building villas for rich people. But meanwhile, you know, the Vietnamese population were rebuilding the neighborhoods of the cities and the towns, uh, the shop houses in particular, and they were left to themselves to design their own houses. This house here, is down in the Mekong Delta. It's a rural house, you know, so you know, there was no way that there was an architect involved in the design of this. When you look at this design, it uses that vocabulary, the language that was developed by these young graduates out of the uh, Fine Arts College in, in Hanoi. So by the time I arrived in Saigon in September, 1971, uh, work here for a year managing construction contracts on behalf of the US Navy. I was living in the uh, Badger officer's quarters up the, up the road there off to the left. And as I was walking down this street, which is now Lake T Rank Street in District 1 of uh, Ho Chi Minh City, you know, all these apartment houses were beautiful modernist. And then the next street over parallel to this, uh, to the left, which is now Nguyen Chai Street was 100% beautiful modernist shop houses. I just, I just graduated from architecture school the year before and I uh, was used to seeing modernism. There wasn't then and there isn't still now much modernist architecture to see in America 
or in Europe, because those cultures never did embrace modernism. But here, obviously, the Vietnamese population embraced modernism as a big, in a big way. I was also surprised to see the amount of factories I saw ringing the city and also up towards uh, Bien Hoa. Uh, not only that, but the second surprise is they used modernist architecture. So this is another factory. The Bata, the Bata company, of course, was one of the first international com multinational companies. They had factories and retail shops in virtually every country in the world, and they would use local architects uh, to design their facilities. So this factory, <coughs> excuse me, out in District 10 of Ho Chi Minh City is a beautiful example of this vocabulary, this the language of Vietnamese modernism that these young graduates uh, developed. So on the, the notice on the left-hand side, you got Brie Soleil, vertical fins, sun-blocking elements. And then on the other side, it's a completely different motif, uh, double wall construction. In this case, a common Vietnamese modernist technique, the apparent outer wall or the guard rails, and then you got the corridor, exterior corridor, and then the weather wall beyond, double wall construction. And notice how those guard rails just sort of curve out towards the end. That is a poetic touch uh, um, that uh, is very common in Vietnamese architecture, but you rarely see in international modernist architecture. So when industrialists start to use modernist architecture for their facilities, you know uh, that the population has embraced modernism and, and, and they saw the value of using modernist architecture to enhance their image uh, or at least to fit in with the culture. This beautiful one pillar stair here, it's incredible. This is a warehouse in District 4 of Ho Chi Minh City. These photographs, by the way, most of them are the beautiful ones for sure are by Alexander Gural, French photographer work, worked with me in our book. Now for housing, in the 1930s, the colonial government was changing their approach to uh, the Vietnamese culture and the Vietnamese people. They were hiring more Vietnamese employees uh, for the bureaucracies. They needed places to stay. There was an influx of people coming in from the provinces in search of economic opportunities. So the French developers started building these simple modernist apartment blocks, uh, especially downtown district one and then moved farther out into the, the other neighborhoods in the inner city. Uh, but by the 1950s and 60s, the Vietnamese architects had pretty well perfected the housing design as shown in 151 Nam Ki Koinia Street in District 3 of uh, Ho Chi Minh City. I think this, uh, we don't know who the architect was, but those blue ceramic mosaic tiles are a signature element of Nguyen Quang Nhac, uh, who was the director of the Saigon School of Architecture in the 1960s. The French architects continued to do Art Deco design of housing in the 1930s and the 1940s. This is designed by Paul Visser. This is one of four such structures in this compound here. The Vietnamese architects just jumped right over them into modernist architecture. Uh, so this is an example. This is behind the Opera House, the Municipal Theater, downtown uh, Ho Chi Minh City. This is a potentially bulky building in its day, uh, but by using those brief soleil screens as a second skin on the building, it breaks down the scale of the building to uh, something that humans are, can more easily relate to, as opposed to those international style, style towers, more recent towers off on the right. So as a result, Vietnamese modernist architecture is much lighter, much airier uh, than international modernist architecture. The, as the, the buildings got bigger with the Vietnamese developers using Vietnamese architects. This particular building now is almost 60 years old. It's still in great condition and it's still full of, of, of tenants uh, that from all anecdotal evidence says that uh, they, um, they like living there and they're proud of their units. Now this is just down the street from that one. This is in district one, it's along Chung Din Street. It hasn't fared so well because this is on gold and land. So it's been master plan, remastered plan for, for a redevelopment. So once that decision was made, the building begins to deteriorate. And it's been this way now towards uh, a decade. And it's, it'll probably be there for another decade at the rate things are going right now. 
But this building and then this building exemplify the impact that we as Americans had as we in our occupation of the South um, during the decade of the 60s and into the 70s. We, we were building a lot of infrastructure up and down the country. We had eight international airports with three kilometer long runways, 200 smaller airports up and down the South, six deep draft seaports from Da Nang on down, 3000 kilometers of highways and bridges. We, we built very few buildings. But we needed a lot of office space and a lot of residential space in a hurry in Saigon. So we put request for proposals out to lease building space for the Vietnamese developers. In some cases they had the buildings ready already. In some cases they built them. We didn't ask that they be modernism. We didn't care. Um, all we wanted was modern facilities, bathrooms, <laughs> and air conditioning. That's it. Uh, so these buildings exemplify the many buildings. We, there were over a hundred bachelor or, or enlisted quarters throughout Saigon at one time in, in the early 60s. This is the known as the President Hotel, 500 units in this building. So you can see those five interconnected structures there, those, that black clump in the middle of the photo there had quite an impact on the skyline of Cholan, uh, District 5. Now, most of those buildings that we've been seeing so far were built before 1968. But in 1968, during the Tet Offensive and the following May Offensive, uh, the People's uh, Revolutionary Army fighting with the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. Um, huge swaths of neighborhoods in districts three, five, and 10 were obliterated. So a lot of housing had to be built in a hurry. Uh, so there were about a dozen of these kinds of housing compounds built in those districts in within a year, a year and a half. Um, and as you can see, it's Vietnamese modernist architecture, again, different motifs on each facade. These beautiful stairways, the wide, allow a big deal of socialization as you go up and down the stairs. Of course, the light patterns. Uh, this is another one in District 1 that was torn down uh, uh, three or four months ago, I mean, three or four years ago, uh, because it was on golden land in District 1. This is another housing area, Vinhoi, that's still in District 4. Um, in anecdotal evidence, the great clean that is. Now, this last project so that I want to show uh, is one of the largest of the projects that were built in the South. And this wasn't part of any of the of the methods that I talked about. This was built in the early 1960s as part of a government program to to take people out of the squatter shacks of the informal communities that had been growing as well as provide uh, housing for the many workers that were coming in from the provinces to work in all of the new factories. Uh, so this is called Tanda Housing. It's in the Tanda Peninsula in the northern part of the Bintan district, which is north of the central business district. So within that, those red lines, there's uh, 27.4 hectares in 22 blocks or 22 bars, 4,300 units. So at four to five people per unit, that's about 23,000 people uh, population. Now, 15 of those bars, the lighter colored ones, uh, were built in the early 1960s. Uh, but the darker ones up towards the upper left-hand corner were built as housing for the uh, Vietnamese National Bank, employees of the Vietnamese National Bank in 1972. So one day I was driving down Highway 13 from what has now been Yung Province, and saw this huge construction over in the distance. So I drove over to the shore of the Saigon River. This is looking south towards the Tanda Peninsula. And uh, in the projects that I was uh, working on, we had 300, yeah, 360 units of low cost housing, $450 a unit, uh, one story, uh, very small housing. And then looking at this, the Vietnamese architects and contracts doing these huge projects. This is the end wall of that particular bar of unit, a more recent picture, of course. This is one of the units that was built in the early 60s. So most of them look like this. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty modernist. Um, it compares with uh, the housing you've seen. You probably have images of from housing around the world. I think you'll see some parallels. Uh, 
with what Dr. Schwenkel will be showing you from Guangzhou and Bing. Uh, but uh, a good lesson here, when you look at this, is you can see how adaptable modernist architecture is to the needs of the people and their ability to, uh, uh, to add on to these loggias here or balconies to, uh, uh, to suit their needs. Uh, all of the bars in this housing complex are double loaded quarters like this. So, and every, every one of the units is identical. They're all 44 square meters. Now those X boxes running down the central corridor are light wells that bring light and air down to the corridor as well as the, uh, the bathrooms of the units. So when you look down the corridor, you got these pools of light. Then within the units on the left, the, the entry door there, you're right there, you're in the kitchen, and then you got the bathroom door across from the refrigerator there. That bathroom opens up, backs up to one of those light wells. And then as you turn around, you're looking out towards the loggia or the, uh, the balconies. I, I knew a young family that lived there, went to dinner at their house a couple of times. The young woman was a Vietnamese architect that worked with me uh, for a while. Uh, and they bought into their unit uh, because they thought this would be a great place to raise their two young boys. There was good recreation area around there, lot, nice parks. Uh, so they bought knowing that eventually they're going to get kicked out and only you know, get something less than market value for what they paid for it. But it was, they thought it was a worthwhile investment for the way that they wanted to live. Now, um, this is kind of a prototype. It looks very similar to what you just saw in Tanda and what I think you'll see uh, some parallels with uh, the Guangchun housing. Now, when I was reading Dr. Schwenkel's book, uh, she used the word utopian or utopia many, many times, uh, modifying the word modernist architecture. And, and uh, at first I was a little bit put out because the standard definition of utopia is it's an ideal idea that's impossible to achieve. Then I got to thinking back through architectural history of modernism. Uh, this doesn't apply to classical architecture, but modernist architects from the beginning were very idealistic. They had high ideals, especially for social concerns and especially for worker housing. Uh, so this is one of the first prototypes that was built for what worker housing could be. This is the Weisenhof estate. This was built for the Dutch work Fund exposition in 1927 in Stuttgart, uh, Germany. There are 33.6 hectares. So Mies van der Rohe, the famous modernist architecture, did the master plan and then he designed this particular bar of housing. Uh, there are 21 buildings on the estate, uh, only 60 units. So most of the buildings that were built were smaller. Le Corbusier, he, he invited 17 other architects to build different kinds of housing. Le Corbusier designed two duplex units. So uh, when, you, when you look at, uh, at this, well, the, the point I wanna make about this is that it didn't work. This was too expensive. It was too expensive to use as a prototype for worker housing. So along the way, uh, modernism has failed to meet those ideas. But we all know that uh, there are some examples of worker housing that did come down at a reasonable cost, particularly in the communist bloc countries of Russia and East Germany, where they used uh, prefabricated panelized construction. Now, in my presentation, you'll notice that it's, it's primarily descriptive. And if you read my book, it's also very descriptive of the Vietnamese modernist architecture. And as you look, if you read the, the literature of the history of modernism, it's primarily descriptive. That means we, we go out and we look and we see and we characterize what we see, analyze what we see and see how it fits within the prevailing attitudes towards styles or social concerns. Um, as I read Dr. Schwenkel's book, I was um, really impressed because it shows a new way. Now, as architecture is moving beyond modernism, which it is into the information age, we don't know what that architecture is called yet, but we need a new approach. Um, the architecture was going to be more holistic and the process needs to be more holistic. And I think uh, I welcome you now to listen to Dr. Christina Schwenkel and her presentation to see how a new approach of research uh, can lead us to a new architecture. 
thank you very much. Uh, so I'll close out my presentation here. Okay. So thank you very much, Mel. Um, what I'd like to do now is to encourage um, a conversation between yourself and Christina. And if you'd like to kind of respond to each other and kind of if you have any observations that you've made while Mel was talking and have a bit of a conversation in terms of um, what you've just seen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mel, for that comprehensive overview of, of modernist architecture across time, um, really rich and also across the space of, of Saigon. So thank you for that. Um, rather than uh, engage in conversation, I actually want to start with just a couple of quick questions. And I think that they'll lead us into then the presentation that I'll give on, um, on Bing City. But could you first say something about if you've been able, you spent so much time in, in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, in Saigon, you know, the architecture is so well there. Could you say a little bit about if you've been able to do, determine if there are differences in architectural modern uh, modernisms between uh, before 75 and after 75? I think most of the buildings that you discussed, you had said were up to 68, 72. So how about after 75? After 1975? Well, first of yeah. all, if I've understood your question properly, I don't, I don't have a good knowledge of modernist architecture in the North um, at all. It's unfortunate, I wish I did, but I don't. I just have not spent much time in the North. So all my attention was given to the South over the past 16 years. Yeah, What's in, in Saigon. So in Saigon, mm -hmm. if you have any yeah. insights you can share about, about not post-1975 architecture, because I think that would be then an interesting way to then intersect with um, as the, the conversation that will move then to the North. There okay, well, it is from, from what I see after the, in the first decade after 1975, not a lot got built. Uh, and certainly very few large buildings. So they have one large building that was built uh, in the early 80s, eight, 1983, I think, was the Hua Bin Theater, uh, designed mm -hmm. by Huynh Tan Pat, uh, as well mm -hmm. as another architect whose name I can't remember right now, unfortunately. And that was an interesting style because it was it was still modernist, but because it was a theater, it doesn't have windows, so it was a more of a blocky building. So some people say, "Oh, that's that's northern architecture," but uh, I don't I don't see it that way. It's just by virtue of its uh, of its of its function as a theater, it's blocky, but it has this beautiful brie soleil across the front. But it's still amazing. But as, as uh, after Doi Moi and as things picked up, for a while, uh, some projects were still using the principles of the mid-century modernist architecture. But over time, global globalization has led to more, uh, uh, well, a pluralism of modernist architecture, which is what we see around the world today, a pluralism of different approaches. You got some beautiful architecture, especially for housing that's coming out now. And uh, some of it, I in my research I'm looking at now, information age architecture, uh, I think the Vietnamese architects are leading the world for the information age architecture for small buildings, houses, and schools. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, just to build on what you're saying, the kind of the pluralism of modernism in Ho Chi Minh City in Saigon itself is, is quite unique and specific to that, that historical context. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, here's another question I have for you that I think we could probably come back to. And I, I assume that some of the other participants are, are also thinking about, can you say a little bit more about preservation efforts um, to, you know, to recognize the buildings as a heritage and what have been some of the struggles to, to, um, to receive that kind of recognition? Well, it's, it's definitely been a struggle because lots of heritage buildings have been destroyed after, over the last, especially the last couple of decades. Um, starting, of course, with um, mm -hmm. the colonial buildings because they're in good sites downtown. They're, they're on golden land. They were some of the first to go. Uh, but now it's, it's uh, impacting modernist architecture. And in our book, we had 150 or so projects. You know, by the time it was published, 10 of them were already gone. And already 10 more are gone. You know, so it's, it's hard. Uh, there was a French uh, firm, a French uh, non-governmental organization called PADI. I can't remember their full name. Um, 
I wish I, there was a, a French uh, architect woman that uh, leads that. who has been very good about working with the Vietnamese government to try to list, until you list heritage properties, the government doesn't know to save them, right? Mm -hmm. Finally, they came up with a list of, uh, of French colonial villas in District 3. So now there's a series of villas in District 3 that are going to be well, hopefully saved. Hopefully the government will follow the list that they've instituted. Uh, but they don't have a list of modernist villas yet or a list of anything modernist. Uh, so it's still a struggle, but there have been some uh, successes. Um, Facebook groups like the Saigon Then and Now group and the Saigon, uh, um, can't remember the name of the group. It's a big group. Uh, it has to do with heritage conservation. Um, they led efforts that saved the old um, French colonial office building right downtown behind the uh, city hall building. Uh, they were gonna tear that down for a new administrative center, um, but uh, there was enough activism from that that they were, it made, made the government change their mind, at least for now they've changed their mind. Um, Hopefully it'll stay that way. So there is, there is some activism going on. It's difficult in this country to do that, but uh, it's still going on. There have been some successes. We're building up slowly the awareness. You got to build up awareness in the uh, population. And it's slowly getting there. And when you say to build up an awareness, are you saying to build an awareness of quote unquote modernist architecture? Because it's such a slippery category right, what constitutes modernist architecture. And you yourself said at the beginning that it often does not have a, a name. So is that part of the problem? I'm thinking about from the perspective of Ving and the effort to save some of the housing blocks that were built with the collaboration with East Germany, that whole struggle the, the, to, um, that which was lost to preserve the buildings wasn't about preserving modernist architecture. It was about preserving a specific moment in time of international socialist solidarity. Right, so I had a whole different kind of framing um, that, that the activists felt would be more effective in saving the buildings. Yeah, um, when, I, when I say awareness, the awareness has to come to the Vietnamese people themselves, I think. Uh, because in other locations around the world where heritage conservation has, been, has become more successful, it wasn't until the local populations understood the value of what they had the aesthetic value, the historical value, the uh, economic value, probably most important of all. Till they understand that awareness, nobody cares. And that's the condition that we're in here right now. So until Vietnamese uh, are academics uh, and architects and economists write more and more articles and, uh, and books, you know, I was shocked when I came to do research for my book that no Vietnamese author had written about modernist architecture in Vietnam. You know, so we need, we need more of that in order to increase the awareness. Thanks, Mel. Good, good answers. Thank you. Good questions. Thank you. So now I'd like to, um, invite Christina if you would like to share your presentation with everyone here and it was really thank you it was really interesting to hear your questions and Mel's responses so really enjoyable thank you okay there you go how's that can everybody see that yeah okay yes it's working okay thanks all right so well first of all let me um thank everybody who was involved for organizing this dialogue to chung danielle duke unesco michelle everybody and also especially to mel for such a thought provoking um presentation um especially because i'm not an architect i'm an anthropologist so i'll talk a little bit about how that affects my methods and and I think for the participants who are here, you'll also see a um, quite, quite different focus, but they complement each other in, in really interesting ways. So thank you, everybody. Um, secondly, I would like to um, just kind of point out, go back to, we had a really interesting discussion about the, the title of the talk and the title of the talk is Encounters, right? With architectural modernism. Um, and we wanted to emphasize 
that plurality, which I think Mel, you brought out really brilliantly in your, in your talk. Um, and it's important, especially in the context of thinking about home Saigon and now moving to, to Ving, um, because of a very different historical and political economic context. And by historical, I mean the context in Ving of place annihilation, of complete urban destruction that then necessitated architectural or architecture under emergency conditions, right? In the aftermath of uh, mass bombing over a period of a decade. And, and by political economic, I mean an approach to architecture that was typical um, to socialist countries at that time that was often referred to as socialist modernism. So I would be interested also, Mel, to hear if you um, maybe have some kind of a counter argument there of thinking about capitalist modernism or not in, in the South. But, you know, uh, socialist architecture was often associated um, with socialist modernism and, you know, produced during the socialist era. What's important about that term is it alludes to the fact that architecture was not capital or profit driven, right, but presumably people driven and th that's what I'm going to discuss today right that architecture should allow for a certain kind of of human flourishing um, and that goes back to the call Stalin's call actually right that that you know socialist architecture should you know for building palaces for the people right and not palaces for the privileged so it's in any case I hope that my perspective here today on socialist modernism and Vietnam might serve as a kind of provocation to think about the plurality then of Vietnamese modernisms, um, as well as architecture and urban planning more broadly beyond capitalism. And especially, um, I think this is important to think about in this moment of time to think historically about what lessons were learned in earlier attempts to then provide, to provide quote unquote palaces for the people and by association, by association to envisioning housing, especially um, as a right, right, and not a commodity. So by way of a brief introduction, brief introduction, I'm a cultural anthropologist and I've been working in Vietnam for over 20 years now. And I'm particularly interested in how the built environment embodies and transmits contested memories as urban landscapes and especially socialist landscapes evolve over time. So as I said, I'm not an uh, architect, I'm an ethnographer and I'm interested in architecture, not only as the materialization of ideas, the kind of resulting uh, material and aesthetic form that constitutes the built environment, but also architecture as an ideological project that emerges from particular forms of labor, for example, like the labor of construction, particular building materials, and, uh, and actually most important for the user of architecture. Um, who are, in my view, just as important designers of space and forms as the trained architectures themselves. And that's a point that I kind of argue um, in my book. Okay, so I'm, there we go. All right, so today I'm going to talk about Vietnam's first planned socialist modernist city. Um, that is a subject of my book, The Building Socialism, the Afterlife of East German Architecture in Urban Vietnam. And in a nutshell, it, the book examined post-war decolonization through uh, utopian planning, right? Mel pointed out that I use that term um, utopian, although I use it quite critically in, in the text. I'll come back to that idea in just a minute. Um, as tied to East German architectural transfers and that element of the transnational circulation and the reworking of de and design ideas, right? The, the translation into then so kind of local idioms that, that Mel also talked about. And how and why, I'm interested in how and why those hopeful visions and collective actions to build a, a better, a more just world after the war in Vietnam became increasingly dystopian over time as the buildings fell into what I call unplanned obsolescence because they were supposed to last for up to 100 years, but they fell very quickly into uh, disrepair. So in the interest of time, just going to touch on a few key points in the book that I think are particularly relevant for this event. Um, the book is a visual ethnography of the co-produced buildings, um, co-produced meaning through Vietnamese and East German collaboration, and especially the housing blocks uh, that you see here, one example that you see in the cover of the book, um, and the people who designed, built, and lived in them. And these were often the same people since there was this kind of idea about um, to, to prevent alienation from the product of labor in, in socialism. So the builders were then awarded uh, and given, allocated an apartment. Okay, so as an ethnographer, my methods are quite different. 
And this was a multi-sided in a multi-method decade long project that relied heavily on field work and immersion in order to assume a kind of bottom up rather than top down approach to modernist planning. So by immersion, I mean that I took up residency in uh, the housing estate of the Hutapte that was built for 15,000 workers made homeless by the war. So architecture at this time was defined in no small part by the need to house a growing urban population made homeless um, from a decade of urban destruction and evacuation that empties cities, right? And this is quite then different than the flow of refugees to cities in, in, in the South. So here is the housing block um, where I lived for nine months in C2. And here's, a, you know, and it's great seeing the interiors at Mel Show because, you know, here's my interior here. Um, you'll see it looks very similar, you know, very nice design, nice space, nice use of space. Um, and, you know, but this space, as I will talk about, was at the center of disagreements over, uh, over design that I also traced in the work. And I'm going to talk about in just a minute. Now, as an anthropologist, I was concerned with both outsides, right, such as generous communal spaces, the form of the buildings, but also insides, the domestic, but not always private spaces. So while living in the complex, I participated in, this is part of my methodology um, for people who might be interested in studying these buildings. Um, I participated in everyday life activities to assess how people used and how they repurposed modernist buildings. So eating breakfast at kind of local tea stalls, such as this one here, shopping at local markets that filled in the vast public spaces between the building, right? Because socialist architecture is known for its general, generous public spaces, right? Um, visiting neighbors across the complexes, 19 buildings. I did that regularly every day. Um, to get a sense of the diversity of design, not only outside, but also inside the apartments and how people related to modernist buildings. For example, their ambivalence, some of the ambivalence about indoor plumbing, right, that I go into in, in the book, but also because I wanted to see how people had, here's some, some of the interiors, how people had renovated their interiors, such as this image, this woman here who opened the bottom floor, um, into her walkout basements for livelihood um, purposes so that she could then sell, sell rice. So this approach allowed me to work with a wide spectrum of elite and non-elite state and non-state actors who were involved in the rebuilding of the city after its destruction um, and to analyze the international division of labor and its racial and gender dimension. So here is one an image of one of the construction brigades that was taken by an East German photographer um, since women were the builders of socialist modernism, as I argue in the book, right? And they were mostly migrant women who constituted the majority of the workforce and were then, as I said, were allocated in the apartment and then ended up being my, my neighbors, okay? So here we can see also the kinds of, you know, the ethnic kinds of relations where that German, East German um, experts served as tutors and supervisors then to, to um, the construction workers. Now, um, this is why I asked Mel this question about preservation, because um, conservation, because there was a sense of urgency to this research because of the impending demolition of the housing box at the center of, of the book, which certain groups of residents, um, this is not international, uh, uh, you know, expats, these are groups of residents in the housing themselves protested with some degree of success at the time and argued for their, for um, recognition as heritage. Um, and I mentioned this briefly because it does raise the issue that we should discuss about the future of modernist buildings in Vietnam and, and whether or not they constitute architectural heritage, which clearly um, they do. So let me say a few words about the research site in, in Vinh, in Nghệ An, which is historically considered to be a, you know, a, a kind of poor and unruly backwater frontier town, but also the cradle of the revolution, right? And this is one reason people often ask me why East Germany this is one reason why the so-called children of Marx, um, as they were called, were summoned by the Vietnamese government to help them rebuild what in Vietnam, is, as we know, is called the homeland of Ho Chi Minh. So Vinh was considered to be one of the most, if not the heavy, heavily and most consistently bombed urban industrial centers in northern Vietnam during the air war, targeted by close to, this is um, the city, center here targeted by close to um, 5,000 airstrikes between 1964 and 1973. So the built environment was decimated and the population of 50,000 at the time completely evacuated with all of its facilities and its factories 
they were dismantled, divvy up, and relocated to, to mountains. So the, the city was completely emptied out, um, except for some, some um, military forces that remained. So this wholesale destruction, here is the main street, would turn the city into an urban lab for modernist architectural experimentation um, in order to produce a new social order through mass housing. And the aim was to eliminate spontaneous and disorderly patterns of post-war resettlement um, after people started to return to the city and also to rebuild the nation to advance um, socialism, which I'll talk about more in just a minute. So beyond housing, right, at the micro level, this entailed a comprehensive redesign. This is what the, the previous photo you saw would look like years later. Um, a comprehensive redesign of Ving as a zoned functional city. And as a benchmark of modernist planning that could then be used in other cities in Vietnam, right? And this entailed also the, um, necessitated also the establishment of a building materials industry, including a uh, prefabricated uh, factory to sustain long-term growth. And also this necessitated the training of workers in newly built vocational schools here that then adopted an East German uh, curriculum. So of course this required, uh, in turn required infrastructure, right? We had roads needed to be built, pipes needed to be laid, electric lines run. So, and there was also a need, of course, this is about rebuilding, entirely rebuilding a new society. So there's also a need for social infrastructure, meaning schools and daycare centers, right? And you can also see some of the modernist idioms here adopted here. Um, markets, here's Chiving, um, as well as based sports stadium still in use today, uh, a cinema which has been recently reconstructed, and parks, right? Lots of parks um, and also playgrounds, okay? So architecture was meant to be at this time socially transformative with, with buildings and living practices integrated. And modernism then offered a way to rebuild society and, and the technical and social infrastructure needed to support that, that reconstruction. Um, as I argue in the book, it's important to note this was as much a material project, you know, the rebuilding of the environment or, or reconstituting the built environment holistically as it was a civilizing process meant to engineer a kind of forward looking, newly enlightened socialist humanity with the goal to maximize labor productivity right, through a city that was designed ultimately for workers' um, well-being, okay? Um, and, you know, architects, I'm sure Mel can tell us this, have always dreamed of building a better world, right? But this seem, seemingly kind of tabula rasa, right, situation presented modernist planners with a, a unique opportunity for research. There's a lot of research done on how to rebuild the city, um, and including cultural research, sociological research, ecological research, et cetera an application of what were, you know, arguably universalist Eurocentric uh, models and ideals of tropical urbanism, urbanism that then produce contradictory results, um, as we see here, like, uh, are, you know, adopting palm trees, which of course don't provide any shade, right, and were eventually kind of thrown out as one of the, 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 the main forms of, of green landscaping. Uh, but these kinds of ideas generated skepticism, a lot of skepticism among state officials who viewed then such German plans as a kind of bourgeois design that would better fit European lifestyles um, than it did Vietnam, okay? And it did not fit at all then with the reality of the scarcity of the war, okay? Um, this is very interesting, this, these kinds of controversies, because it helps us to keep in mind that there were different ideas of socialist modern, not to mention modernism, but socialist modernism circulating at the time. And, and also, as scholars have shown us, within Eastern Europe and Soviet Union, uh, between Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union itself. So Vietnamese officials feared that uh, a domestic consumer-driven modernity would emerge rather than the modernity that they wanted to pro uh, promote, which was a kind of socialist collectivist oriented modernity where, where objects, right, would serve social purposes and feel collective needs only rather than individual desires, right, that they felt was being then promoted through the, the German designs. So I think, you know, underlying these transnational alliances, we have to see where these competing logics 
of, of modernism, socialist modernism, and visions of, of the urban future. And Vietnamese people who were part of my project, who I interviewed and lived with, had a very different idea about what urban life should look, look like. And there was no consensus among them either. As I explained in the book, there were huge differences between parts of the, the, the Hutapte, between social groups like workers and government cadres who were housed you know, together alongside one another in, in the complex. Uh, nonetheless, despite the assumption of similar assumptions to modernity, the idea of so universal housing with modern amenities was, was appealing to many Vietnamese planners and workers who were building these houses, but, but not all. And we have to remember that socialist modernist planning at the time, you know, it aspired to lift populations out of deep poverty through rapid industrial and infrastructural development to secure equitable access to public goods, right? That's that, that's that utopian ideal right there, while collectivizing the means of production and also undoing colonial inequalities, right? That prevented Vietnamese residents from having access, um, for example, to infrastructure, energy infrastructure, water infrastructure, et cetera. So people were very committed and excited about this particular vision of a, of a more just city at the time uh, before it then started to decay prematurely, okay? Uh, I emphasize at the time because today, if anybody knows Bing and has traveled to Bing, uh, you'll know that it's a city that that you know foreigners, especially those from Western Europe and North America, tend love to hate. Right? They they like to think of it as you know this decayed modernist housing uh, stands in for the perverse architecture that exists across you know the socialist East. Um, and, and now I should say also that only part of these, you know, the, most of the, the buildings have been demolished over the past four years. Um, but at one point in time, uh, it was described as the most uh, unattractive city in Vietnam in the US press. So the city doesn't draw a lot of international visitors because it doesn't fulfill the kinds of colonial fantasies or orientalist fantasies that tourists often have about Vietnam. In fact, it elicits every stereotype possible about modernist architecture. And many of these I try to myth bust uh, in, in the book. So here, for example, I'm using one of Gerd Wessel, Wessel's cartoons. He's an East German um, cartoonist about prefabricated housing to kind of challenge these ideas that continue to circulate about modernist housing is stifling places of social isolation, for example, or concrete jungles void of urban nature, which was not the case in modernist housing uh, in Bing. Rather, the blocks were full of human activity. Every, every corner was full of human activity, full of green spaces, full of urban farming projects with grazing goats and pecking chickens. And the complex was built to be climate friendly, right? I go into this in the book. The apartments were well ventilated, they were temperate, they were full of light. Um, but on the other hand, they were also moldy and crumbling and they were small. So one has to remember that the city and its integrated housing estate had once elicited over enthusiastic, albeit critical responses among some of my Vietnamese interlocutors. The complex was often described to me as quote unquote unimaginable or utopian at the time, words that people used. Uh, and again, we're talking about a context, right, of complete annihilation and the sudden transformation to a vertical landscape of high rises within a very short period of time, right, within three, four years. And this was a very fast paced project where builders were instructed to maintain the speed of construction. There was a lot of emphasis on speed here. Um, the complex was considered quite visionary at the time in modern and international even as it enabled authorities to govern daily life more effectively through its design. For example, by living in the, the apartment complex, I could see that it was very easy for people to walk by and look in, uh, kind of surveil what was going on in, in the apartments. And several people commented uh, about that, right? Going by the front corridors, but the front corridors also provided more light and also provided air to flow through the apartments. So the, the housing and its facility promised people stability and, and normalcy, and, and people were quite proud of these apartments, not, not unlike what Mel was saying about the, the you know, public housing that was built in, in Saigon at that time, right? And you can see in this staged image, right? It really kind of gave this idea that people after the war, right, and after being homeless for so long, could finally achieve the simple, but a good and peaceful life. And this was really important to, to residents who moved in.
Now, the housing estate was also the one of the first of its scale in Vietnam at the time, and it catapulted Ving to the future as it kind of leapfrogged over Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, if only for a very brief period of time before it would again lag behind, right? So it's, it's newfound celebrity and uh, modernity was celebrated in the press. It was often used as an iconic photo backdrop. This is the, when families, 300 families were moving in. It was also used as an iconic photo backdrop um, for domestic visitors here dressed up for the, the Lunar New Year. And at the level of affect, right? I was really interested in people's aff affectations or affective connections to the housing. Beyond ideology, it was quite meaningful for people to participate in this international solidarity project, as it was called, on both sides, right? Even though there were clear global hierarchies that I mentioned that structured that very need for this kind of technological support to flow between and material support to flow between the so-called second and third worlds at that time. Um, and it was through this outpouring of sentiment that I focused a lot on in the research, you know, expressed me through songs, poems, letters, photographs, jokes, stories, et cetera, that people shared with me over the course of, of the, the research, over the course of the nine months that I lived in the housing, that I came to realize the extent to which that residence lives were so deeply intertwined with the lifespan of these modernist buildings through the design, their construction, the allocation, the use, the adaptation that I'll show in just a minute, and the revaluation in the moment of capitalist redevelopment, right, when they're threatened then to be demolished as the quote unquote best housing in Ving, as one woman yelled to me from her crumbling second story stoop. Um, of course, not everybody agreed with that assessment, right? This is very something about, much about the older generations who held on to this almost kind of nostalgic connections um, to the apartments. Uh, older generation preferred the to the more um, recent capitalist one, um, mostly because of their dislike of the new modern design, which they saw as more, in their own terms I'm using here, more profit and less people oriented without balconies or social fields, so they criticize the design. They also have a very deep distrust of domestic construction standards or materials, so in this way they were able then to revalue their own apartments as quote unquote, German made and German designed and used with quote unquote, German um, construction materials. And they held on to that, that, that kind of um, um, ideolo ideology of so the, the supremacy of German engineering through today. Um, so rather I, than, so just yeah. sorry to interrupt, just saying we're if, uh, coming to um, 20 minutes. So if, just to, if you, there's some more points you'd like to make. Yeah, okay. So let me jump then to that, um, the uh, talk a little bit about shifting gears here to the kinds of the modernist architectural transfers and the limitations of these kinds of ways that they travel um, and, and, and were interpreted um, between the North and South, because I think this can be interesting for us thinking about um, how built forms and spatial practices and lines that constitute the modern urban were constantly then being um, remade and redrawn, for example, single use space becoming a um, mixed use space. So let me turn to that and then I'll, I will um, wrap up. Oh, okay. So um, as I argued that this was not just about building high rise um, architecture, right? It was also about creating new modern ways of living based on kind of European ideologies. So that the design models that were then circulated were um, significantly modified to accommodate alternative cultural ideals. So um, let me show you some of the ways in which very briefly the, the um, Vietnamese authorities, they are very uncomfortable with this kind of, of design here. And the lifestyle of what they saw as socialist abundance that the plan seemed to promise, which are contrary then to these kinds of post-war conditions of scarcity. So the, the apartments were seen as too large, right? And they were seen as family focused and moving away then from the collective, right? Which earlier housing complexes had focused on collective living or two families per apartment. Whereas the East German design was emphasizing privatization, one family, private meaning that one for each family would have their own private um, space. Um, and this was a time where people needed housing. So the government was thinking less in terms of people having access to more space and more in terms of get people as many housing as possible. So that they then divided the apartments into two families um, per unit, even, and then this led to so structural overload. And then this is one of the reasons given for the, the, um, for the decay. So another reason that uh, is given to the K is because of the ways in which um, 
the design imposed on then Vietnamese inhabitants a kind of cultural model that did not translate well for the residents themselves. So I'll just show you some brief pictures and wrap up here. Um, the GDR, GDR architects wanted to keep separate private spaces and public spaces, which we know are always blurred in Vietnam, right? And they wanted to separate living and livelihood practices, which we know are also integrated in Vietnam. Um, so they went about re, um, renovating their apartments and I'll show you how they created um, Here's some renovations here, how they went to create extra space by adding additions onto balconies. They, um, here's one of the spaces inside the balconies that then becomes a part of the house, right? Actually offers an extra a bedroom here. They then, as I had showed you before, they enlarged their walkout basements. They opened up floors, turning them into shops, businesses, restaurants, and animal coops. Courtyards became badminton courts. Sunny corners uh, became uh, places for drawing incense of local temples, right? And showing us all how these generous communal spaces became then spaces of the commons. And, and I'll just wrap up here by saying, you know, we can see how this idea of the kinds of like brutalist modernist architecture, right? That breaks down and encourages social isolation, right? By living in the complexes, getting inside rather than looking from the buildings on the outside, but really getting inside into the daily life. We can see that the ways in which then the Vietnamese residents themselves have turned modernist architecture into incredibly vibrant social spaces. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. And now, Mel, if you have any thoughts or questions um, from uh, Christina's uh, fabulous presentation. Well, she certainly covered a lot there. It's like a book. It, it took me a long time to read the book. There's so much in there. But uh, uh, she said a couple of things I have questions about because I just don't know. You, you used the word contested memories. Can you describe a little bit what that means? Um, simply put, that different people have different memories associated with, with space through different ways in which they relate to the past and relate to, to um, material culture, such as buildings. So that, that would apply to the people that are living there now, having different memories than... Yes, yes. Than and, that, and that, you know, I, I don't go into it in the talk, but do go into it in the book. Also, the ways in which different people related to the space differently based on their own social positioning, right? And it's really important then to see that there's not this kind of embrace of modernism, like who embraced modernism, who were, you know, had some ambivalence about moving into the buildings. You know, this was a whole new form of, of, of living. We have to remember that time, right? To move from like horizontal life to vertical life is not natural. Like you had to produce a kind of modern sensibility, right? And a desire to want to live in concrete structures. Um, so, in thinking about the ways in which people they're, they're, um, were kind of constituted differently in relationship to these buildings, and yes, there were definitely contested memories there as well. Yeah. It, it, was, it was interesting as I was reading the book, but also in your presentation here, as you talked about the people-driven design. And, it was, and you know, it, was, it was interesting to follow the discussion in the book about between the, the, the give and take between the uh, Oh, I'll call them the socialist bureaucrats, uh, for lack of a better word. I should find a better word, but uh, and the people that were going to live there, as well as the East German planners, and then the Vietnamese planners. So there's really four groups of people uh, in conversation about design, which is which is really interesting. That is very people driven, you know, because you asked about well, maybe what's the difference between capitalist modernism, uh, capitalist housing, you know, most uh, all the housing that I was showing. You know, the units are, 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 are simple and bare. So the people themselves would add in partitions if they want a separate bedroom. So they're just wide open spaces. The only walls are around the bathroom, uh, open plan. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the, that the capitalist approach normally is, that, uh, as an architect, if I'm designing housing, I ask the developer, hey, what's your marketing study say? What, what do you think you can sell? Uh, that how, mm -hmm. how big are the units? What kind of amenities do they have? Or if you're working with a public client of making public housing, you look to the bureaucrats to say, well, are, are given our discussions with the potential users here, this is what we think you need. You know? So mm -hmm. architects very rarely got involved, unfortunately, in those kinds of discussions. Mm -hmm. Other building types we would, but generally not for housing. So it's driven, definitely driven by marketing marketing studies. Yeah. 
That's very interesting. And at the time, I mean, this is of course change, right? The landscape of architecture is, is fundamentally transformed in, in all over Vietnam, as we know, um, and also in Ding. Um, and at the time, I mean, the, the you know, you said it's market driven, market study driven. Um, that was one thing that was quite surprising to me, the extent to which the design of the buildings was linked to ecological studies, as I had mentioned, but also about sociological studies. What's interesting there is that the East German architects did a lot, spent a lot, they were like ethnographers. They spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what do people do when they get up? Where do they go to work? How do they, you know, what kind of transportation do they use? How do they live? Okay, well, they don't live in nuclear families. They knew that, but the design produced certain kinds of limits for them to then materialize the kinds of cultural insights that they had. So there was also that kind of interesting disconnect. So when I asked them, why did you design for nuclear families when you knew that there were, you know, three generation families? Well, of course we knew that. We did our cultural assessments. We knew that, but we weren't able to then accommodate that. And that's actually one thing that the Vietnamese government was also pushing forward that were the, the nuclear families at that time, since people were also identified through their work brigades and their work units, right? That was quite important then, so. I'm surprised about uh, the 100 year life uh, expected of these buildings, um, um, especially for housing, uh, because they used lower cost materials. So I don't, I don't think that was a reasonable <laughs> expectation. Uh, 50, getting 50 to 60 years is really pretty good. And, and housing styles change over time, people change over time. So you know, major public buildings like City Hall, yes, they expect them to last 100 or more years. But uh, housing, I don't know, 100 years, too much. Well, that's very interesting that you say that, because I, I find this just kind of rhetoric. Um, and, and that's, you know, um, I'm in Berlin right now, and that was the rhetoric that was used here. It was 80 years, right, that we're building these prefabricated in Year. And I don't think it's so much about the number as it is about the idea of an eternal socialism, right? And that was the fundamental idea. Um, so we know, right, that, you know, and that's why I play with capitalism, it's planned obsolescence, right? Capitalism is, is you know, it's about capital. Like, how can we continually reproduce the landscape for, for the purposes of capital accumulation? So we have planned obsolescence. And that's why I play with that to say, well, this was unplanned obsolescence, right? It was supposed to last forever because socialism is, socialism is based on the ideology that it will be here forever. This is our future. Um, and so it also became quite symbolic that the buildings then started to crumble. And, and many people made those kinds of links between the, the ways in which the state you know, quickly moved into a, you know, a form of kind of ne neglect, right? For the people who were living in the buildings, a lot of that had to do with um, discrepancies and arguments about who's responsible for maintenance and upkeep. Should the East Germans be responsible for that? Well, what happens when there's no more East Germany? Is the German, the you know, reunified German government going to be responsible for that? Should people be responsible for that? What about the Vietnamese government? So a lot of the kinds of conversations there about responsibility around upkeep, um, and then the kinds of like dissolution of the dream of you know the eternalism of socialism. Thank you very much. So some very interesting kind of questions and considerations there in terms of um, obsolescence built into them, the structures. So um, now we've got some great questions for you uh, from the people who've been listening. So I'd like to um, share them with you. So from um, Pia Buller is asking, I would be interested to hear about local approaches to first of all, the choice of material and secondly, adaptation to tropical climate. So uh, I assume he's asking about mid-century modernist architecture, right? Yeah. Uh, one of the interesting things that um, Dr. Schwenkel wrote about in, uh, in Guangzhou and Ving was the original idea was to use this panelized, prefabricated panelized uh, construction, the German word platten bow, right? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Um, yeah. You know, which didn't happen. They used the standard uh, Southeast Asian construction, the reinforced concrete frame and brick infill. That is the standard uh, construction for all of the modernist architecture in the South. And, and it continues to be. Look at every high rise going up, reinforced concrete frame, brick or block infill for walls, and they're all plastered over. So when you ask about materials, um, there isn't much discussion about basic materials, structural materials, at least in Vietnam design. 
when you start looking at uh, villas, houses, it gets a lot more interesting, but uh, not for housing or for industrial facilities. Is that, do you, you suppose that answers this question? Yeah, and just, put, and just more the second part, the adaptations that you noted for the tropical climates, as opposed to like the Kubusia kind of buildings examples you were showing. Oh, definitely. No, no question about it. These techniques that they developed, the double wall construction, the Brie Soleil, everywhere, definite adaptations to the tropical climate from the word get go. But that's it's also why I, I, I look at the DINs, the, the traditional Vietnamese architecture. They were designed from the get go for the tropical climate too, right? So they were able to use those principles and combine them with Western ideas of modernism to come up with Vietnamese modernism. Thank you. So now we um, will go to another question from uh, Van. So thank you very much for this presentation today. I le have learned a lot. I have the questions as below. What is a typical plan of a modernist townhouse in Saigon? Is it or does it have any different spatial organization with the current tube house? I normally see only the facades. And two, is the wall on modernist house have two layers with an air gap in between? And this is from Hun Bang Kang. Yeah, you're really asking about contemporary uh, shop houses or townhouses, though not the, not the mid-century. But um, my answer to the question is that um, when I designed my own house, uh, I noticed that most of the shop houses, my neighbors live in shop houses, there's a pretty standard plan. You got a stairway in the middle and you got bedrooms on the upper floors on each side. So it's very efficient. There's no, no need for corridors. So that's kind of a standard, uh, very efficient Vietnamese plan. A lot of uh, shop houses you see built and most of the shop houses are designed without architects. Uh, so they all know about that. It makes sense. But uh, in the new, in the new architecture now, that's all the, the architects are blowing the interiors apart. Uh, so you know they're more, much more open plan, much more open volumes. There's a lot of very interesting things happening with Vietnamese contemporary architecture of uh, shop houses. Uh, what was the last part of that question? Okay. Um... And about talking about the two layers with an air gap. Oh, yeah, point. yeah, that, <laughs> that uh, you know, in America, you don't build brick walls without having the air gap. You have to have that. Otherwise, you get water infiltration in, into the space. You know, one of the, uh, I've rented a lot of houses in Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City before I built my own house. And, and they had just one layer of brick and every time you, you put a piece of furniture like this bookcase up against the wall, the water comes through and, the, and it rots out the bookcase. That had to happen a couple of times. And so when I built my own house and uh, you build with two uh, layers of brick with the gap in between, so that keeps the water for infiltrate. That's just, uh, that's, what we're, that's, what we're, that's how we've learned how to do things properly as long as you got enough money to do it. Uh, so as I watch uh, townhouses go up in my neighborhood, half of them are doing it that way, the other half are doing it mm. the more traditional way. So depends on how much money you got. Yep, great, and, and it explains a lot probably. We always wonder why that's happening. So now we know with the where we're living, <laughs> it's great. Yeah. So um, I have another question from HP. So they're asking what and we've touched on it, I think, in both of you in your talks. Um, but if you want to elaborate further, so what brought about the unplanned obsolescence of these constructions? Christina, why don't you try that one? <laughs> Not an easy answer. Um, and so in the book, uh, what I don't try to do, what I don't do is give you an answer, right? What I do is uh, position different people's perspectives on who is responsible for the unplanned uh, obsolescence. Um, so there are many kinds of um, agents here who have, um, you know, taken the blame. First and foremost is the, East, the, the reunified German government says it's the shoddy East German construction, right? And the shoddy East German materials, which most of my interlocutors don't agree because they actually see it as high quality materials and high quality engineering compared to what was available at the time. Um, there is the argument from the East German planners themselves who were part of my project and who were part of my interviews and, and field work who said it had a lot to do with, um, especially so the, the blocks, the blocks that then doubled the number of, of um, families 
you know, the structural load actually was doubled, right? Those are the ones that are like, you know, were to, and some are still standing, um, reduced to like 40% of its strength uh, compared to the other ones that were still at 60, 70% um, in terms of the, the quality that's evaluated every year by the um, Department of Construction. Um, and those were all the, the, the blocks that had two families per units and about, especially in one of the units, unit C9 still had 10 families that were living for the past 35 years of two families per unit. So um, that's part of the also contributing to the, the decay time, climate, you know, the tropical climate. However, the most interesting argument that I found, the state, of course, of not investing in upkeep. People were quite critical of the state and not investing in upkeep. Debates that go on between what is, because the state had said in the law is that people inside the apartments need to take maintain inside and then the state is responsible for outside, but then where is that line between inside and outside? So that was a, a big part of the research, like listening to how people declare what becomes their responsibility or not, or the collective responsibility, so that that you know uh, an entire block would get together to, to do repairs together. Um, and the last one that was the most interesting for me, and I kind of end the book on this note, is the way in which that um, migrant women have been blamed for the, the um, urban obsolescence. And that's kind of one of the main arguments of the book, that women women who were during the war responsible for defending the nation and then they were responsible for rebuilding the nation uh, are now the ones that are you know being blamed for leading to unplanned obsolescence because they are um, you know they were young migrant women and they quote unquote don't know how to live in modernist buildings so they had practices that were more um, accommodating of their their kinds of rural lifestyles than what an urban kind of uh, uh, lifestyle should be okay very interesting answer thank you so now I'll go to um, Emmanuel Pavel. So he's asking about, saying, thank you very much for these very interesting presentations. And I've questioned for Mel and Christina about tourism. So today the Balcafe is in interviews like uh, Concafe, uh, propaganda posters. Could resorting to tourism help these buildings preservation and visibility, in particular by the inhabitants themselves in the manner of greeters. Are you aware of any initiatives in this direction and what do you think about it? Thank you in advance. Okay, I can say a few words about it. Like, yeah, absolutely, like, you know, in Hanoi, you, you have the Balkop tourism and the, you know, what I call it, the, the Vina nostalgia. Uh, you know, tourism going on uh, and, but and they know, I mean, that's what's so interesting. And that's part of like when the activists, the housing activists were trying to think of ways in which they could preserve, at least, you know, the idea was, okay, you know, it's like, do you want to re rehabilitate or rebuild, right? And the vast majority of the the um, elderly people who had been living in the buildings in, in the Hutapte since 1970s had said that they wanted to um, renovate. They did not want to rebuild. The younger people who had moved in and didn't have a, a connection to you know, this past. And remember, as I said, that the people who worked on the buildings were allocated a unit. So it wasn't just that they had lived there a long time and had community. They were actually had been responsible for building, right? So it was a part of their labor. Um, so that kind of deep connection. But people who moved in, right, after you were allowed to buy and sell after the, the new land law, um, and privatization occurred, then they had no connection to that past. So they were like, for sure, we want to move into modern buildings, the newest modern buildings. They had a whole different conception of what was modern. Socialist modern was no longer modern. It was you know, outdated, so on. So the elderly people who were kind of thinking about how can we sell this as heritage came up with that idea of tourism as well. Would people be interested in seeing these buildings as, again, you know, thinking about it as representative of a particular moment of international solidarity? So at that point, I shared with them, um, you know, some of the um, stuff I had collected from, you know, Western guidebooks and this idea of, you know, pretty much it has been put forth that Ving is like, you know, a, a slum town because of the middle of, of these buildings. And people were quite shocked. They had never, you know, thought of themselves of, of living. Of course, they know that their buildings are decrepit and decaying, but they'd never thought that they are living in a place that people so disliked. Um, so that was kind of shock shocking to them. So the idea that, you know, this is a, you know, as it's called in the literature, quote unquote, the perverse socialist architecture, like who'd want to live in these, these, you know, who those buildings. Um, once I kind of shared that with them, you know, it was an interesting kind of response. They were actually also quite upset with the journalists they had taken in and shown their homes, who then rather than seeing the kinds of 
ways in which people's creative resources have been applied to creating, you know, in some cases, quite nice living environments, in other cases, not for the, the poor families, had then kind of been slotted under this term of a slum. And, you know, who wants to go visit quote unquote a slum? Okay. Very interesting. Thank you. And so, okay. Oh, and a question here. I suppose um, some people have been kindly answering the question. So, Christina, can your book be purchased in print form in Vietnam or uh, someone was saying it's available by Kindle, but mm -hmm. it is available in Kindle and in, you know, I purchased it myself by Kindle and beyond. So I know it's possible and I do have friends who, is, who have purchasing Kindle. Um, it's not in Vietnamese yet. Um, you know, long dream down the road, hopefully in terms of buying it in print form, if someone's interested, they can be in, in contact with me. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, lots, lots of thank yous, which is really nice. So I'll just scroll down. I just saw there's questions in the chat and questions in the Q and A. So I want to make sure I get make sure everyone is covered. Okay. So now we have um, by Min Win Tuan a question for um, Mel. So you mentioned that the Vietnamese government has focused more on preserving French architecture than on modernism ones. So this seems to be in contrast with the fact that Vietnam is a developing country and people tend to maximise the functions and conveniences of their homes. They should be more eager on the modern architecture than the local colonial architecture, which is expensive and there's too many architectural details. So um, I suppose suggesting that maybe that focus on preservation would be you know, encouraging it to shift. So what do you think? Well, I make a distinction between heritage buildings that that are large and have public uses as opposed to people's shop houses. Because I kind of got the sense from that question that they're thinking of people living in shop houses, modern shop houses. What, what's important in uh, Hanoi and uh, the Da Nang even, and uh, certainly in, in Ho Chi Minh City, is that uh, these cities have this rich mix of historical periods and architecture that goes with those historical periods. And a lot of Southeast Asians, no longer cities have that, just Singapore, right? So as, uh, as the decision makers try to make decisions about urban development, and uh, if they were to consider tourism to a much greater degree, they might worry more about keeping this rich mix of mm -hmm. architecture and historical styles because that's what attracts people to come. Um, but from what I see, the, the real model they look for is Singapore. Mm -hmm. And um, not, not a good model from a historical preservation point of view, for sure. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, there's a Kind of a comment but compliment for you mel um so i know the, these questions could be difficult because of the lack of documents but they're saying that they've had a look at your house on facebook and they love it especially the way you treat the high windows and louvers oh thank you well <laughs> sir, it, nice. you know in this lockdown period i've been i haven't been out of my house in four months except to go get a a, a shot and uh, it's been very, very comfortable for me. Uh, I normally don't use air conditioning. Uh, it's there, I am open to the outside all the time, so I don't feel mm -hmm. cooped up. And I'm a writer. I just soon be at home writing anyway. Mm -hmm. Less distractions. Uh, so this house has been very comfortable for us during this time. Okay, thank you very much. And here, uh, hi, Mr. Mel. It's Win Nopson from the UAE. Yeah. yeah, I know him very well. Okay. He, he teaches Western uh, history of Western architecture at um, the University of Art of uh, Architecture in Ho Chi Minh City. Lovely. So he's saying that just to let you know that I will show you the Saigon reconstruction plan by the General mm -hmm. Department of Housing and the General Department of Construction after Tet Mao Tang 1968. Yeah, I'd mm -hmm. like to see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and beside the arch, it's interesting when people come together, isn't it? All these. Yeah. And beside the architects of the General Department of Housing designed the Tangda housing area. And one of them was architect Diep Van Kyo, I hope I'm pronouncing things right, who graduated from the Saigon School of Architecture. Oh, so. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, Ngap San again because it's been a long time and I have a lot of questions for him. So that's good. So Thank now you for your comments, Ngap San. 
And now I think we've just touched on a bit, we're talking about Saigon. I'm um, saying for uh, Mel, but Christina also, if you have comments, like how do you compare between modernism in Saigon and other cities in Southeast Asia, like Bangkok, for example? Well, from my point of view, having traveled to those, uh, none of the other cities, Kuala Lumpur, Bangkok, uh, Singapore, for sure, none of them reached this level of the quality of mid-century modernist architecture. Uh, because most of the housing in those cities is uh, very utilitarian. It's all the same. Uh, you, you know, even if you go to Phnom Penh, um, the good places there, the shop, uh, the uh, historical shop houses from the mid-century were designed by Vietnamese architects. Um, when you go when you lead, when you go further out from the inner city, everything starts to become the same. The same units of uh, ventilation screens used everywhere, right? That's the same in Bangkok. You got the same window unit is used everywhere, right? So in all of those other cities, they didn't reach this level of individualistic modernist architecture that was reached here in Vietnam, both north and south. Thank you. And Christina, do you have any comments? So, okay. So, uh, well, I'd have to say, real, just real briefly, given that um, I just came back from the Southeast Asian Modernism exhibit here in Berlin, <laughs> that uh, I think you might have would have a little different opinion, Mel, if you were able to attend the exhibit. It's, yeah, I was actually I wish quite I could. amazed at the at the diversity of my, and just it was just beautiful. Some of the photographs. So I'll take a couple images and show you because I'd love to hear your your yeah. response. Yeah. Okay, so um, okay, so thank you, Mel Schenk and Christina, for such interesting views on anthropology relate in relation to architecture and how both can support each other to better people's life. My question is more on Christina's research direction in the future. Will you keep on researching this topic of modernist architecture's effect on people's lives, or will you be more interested in how this research will help to improve how people's contemporary is correlation between these two thank you yeah that's a great question and I, I would say ideally i would say yeah that would be great to bring them both together um you know right now it's um they've removed most of the buildings not all of them and you know i i I should also point out that I continue to do the research in Bing, not just the during the field work. I'm back there every year and I continue to be in touch with people. And so, you know, there's several of the what's great about the movement and the activism that's taken place. And it is activism, in my view, that has taken place for people not to be dispossessed and not to be removed from the city center is that they have been able to stay in the city center. And so the new buildings that I showed you in that slide, the, the um, residents have moved over in there because part of the argument is they, they need to keep their communities together. I mean, these are people who have been together since they were teenagers in the war years. And then, you know, that's, that, that's their community and family. So um, I yes, I haven't continued with that research to see, you know, what does that look like? And, you know, not surprisingly, these kinds of, you know, sterilized places have sprung up and become communes and, you know, communal spaces, spaces of the commons, not commons, commons, um, and, you know, new new markets springing up, right, and new ways in which the space is being then used communally. Um, so, yeah, so that's next on the agenda is like looking at the ways in which that struggle to stay in the city center, not to allow the city Right, because it really speaks to this idea that only oh, liberalism results in dispossession. Like, and, and if you look at the specific ways in which um, the arguments that were made, how residents use state discourse and state logic to then argue for their right to remain in the city center, so that you have working class people and and seniors and you know people who are considered quote unquote um, poor, a category that many people actually um, contest. Um, remaining in the city center, right? You don't have gentrification in the way in which we often think about gentrification. So that is the direction that the, the project is going. And, and part of it is because of the close relationships that, are, you know, that I build there that I, that I attempt to try to maintain as best that I can. Thank you. And Mel, did you want to respond? We have... No, not really. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Sorry. <laughs> so, and now for... Davide Guarini Gilmartin. So two great perspectives from both speakers and Mel mentioned the importance of architectural heritage preservation being owned by the local population. And Christina also mentioned the older locals in Vin wishing to preserve their kutate. I'd be interested to hear not just from Mel and Christina, but if possible from others on the call about any trends or initiatives in this important area of awareness raising. <laughs> 
Okay, so um, yeah, so it would be so if is anyone in, in that area, so maybe we can continue the conversation. Um, it, yeah, that's a very interesting area to find out more from other people. And this is the, fi the final question that we have is from Tam Trang Vu. So in Hanoi, the architects are considering to propose the solution of preserving these tungku by removing the extension to return the original shape of the buildings, the mm -hmm. ones that are not that damaged in quotes, combined with technical measures to ensure the sustainability is possible to renovate the interior in the direction suitable for modern life, instead of the solutions the government has been implementing, which are adding in new living spaces or bringing down the old and damaged ones. It is even possible to combine two old apartments into one new apartment to increase living comfort. What do you think about these solutions? Would this plan be possible with the context of the Vietnamese government's budget? Boy, that's a that's a really complex question. There's a lot in there to mm -hmm. kind of unpack. Uh, but the, one of the initial statements in the question was about uh, tearing taking out what the tenants have already built, mm -hmm. which I don't think is a good idea. Uh, preservation is also about the cultural uh, life of that building, and over the fifty or sixty years that they've been there, the what the people have done there in building the kinds of things that uh, Dr. Schwenkel showed us at uh, Guangzhou uh, are very important cultural artifacts of history. Uh, so you, you should preserve those too. Um, maybe Christina, uh, Dr. Schwenkel can jump in here at this point in time. Yeah, I think you, I, you just said that so beautifully, Mel, that preservation is also about preserving cultural life. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, that's what gives the life to these buildings are the ways in which people have utilized their, their resources and visioned themselves as middle class, you know, their middle class subjectivities and creating the beautiful spaces of the homes that I think then would, um, we would lose if they were to be removed, the, the koinoi and the so-called tiger cages. Um, and it's also, you know, as I argue in the book too, there's this way in which the Vietnamese press represents the Khôn Nguyen as dangerous, as shoddy, as not well designed. Uh, and I, you know, I picked it apart in the book by just showing them as how much time and effort and design and high quality materials goes into producing them. And then showing them from the inside the ways in which they do help people to achieve a kind of middle-class status that they aspire to. Now that's not to say none of them are dangerous or that they haven't contributed to the, the, you know, the rapid decay of the buildings. But it is to give us a different kind of sense because it's so easy to stigmatize people and their actions, as I just mentioned, especially with the migrant women, the workers, um, rather than trying to understand the kinds of logics and the actual outcomes of these kinds of, what I call in the book, the design interventions. So I would argue for keeping them as well. So on that note, I think I'd like to thank you very much for such generous presentations, sharing your research, very, very insightful, um, and also very inspiring for the work that um, Hanoi Ad Hoc is undertaking as well, and where we can go with um, what we're doing here. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Christina Schwenkel and Mel Schenk for your presentations this evening. And so everyone, if we just enjoy with our digital online, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very thank you, much. Everyone. Thank, you. thank you all from uh, Ad Hoc Hanoi for inviting us and, and keep up the good work that you're doing. This is great. This is part of raising that awareness. Thank you for the great questions, everybody, all the participants who came. Yeah. Really appreciate that. Okay. So thank you everyone for joining us um, and look forward to you joining us again. We will have another talk in a, a month or two and we're welcome to invite you in continuing this exploration of the built environment in Vietnam. So thank you so much.